Indonesia or Malaysia, they say, you know what, I can easily bring brands like Uniqlo, H&M or whatnot, but if the market is not ready, I don't go for it yet, right? We spoke to SM and they said, you know what, we can afford the best malls in the country and make our malls as beautiful as any of the best malls in Singapore, but we hold restraint. Why? Because if we make our malls, maybe I'm oversimplifying it, paraphrasing it a little bit. If I make my malls too beautiful, the market might not come in because they would be afraid and they say, this is not for me. And so it's a different kind of mindset that companies have to work out for. Um, maybe just to give you a gist of some of the findings that we have, um, forgive the fancy terminology. Uh, the strategies include, number one, preserving institutional legacy. And by that, really, I think what you mean is that we need to have respect for the infrastructure and institutional voids. And when you say respect, means, number one, on the one hand, you might want to try to address it. But many of these firms could not afford to be messianic. They also have to respect it, meaning work with the institutional voids, work with the infrastructure gaps. If traffic is a problem and you can't solve it, don't just say, it. then I can't put up supermarkets in big cities go to the suburban areas where the people are so that they don't have to worry about traffic. Right? Um, deep and localization. Going back to that example of Alphamart. When Alphamart, it was a good idea. Anyone doing a business model, for example, or preparing this for a management report would say, hey, it's a brilliant idea. There's a customer pain point. Customers don't want to leave their homes. They're in Cavite, they're in Cainta, they're in Quezon City, <laughs> or wherever. They're in the suburbs. They don't want to go all the way to Makati or to Cobao or whatnot to shop. So I'm just going to put up the big grocery marts right, near their homes. But immediately Alpha Mart faced the problem, again because of the institutional voids. They realized, okay, if I'm going to open up a world-class 24-hour convenience store like grocery in the suburbs, my main problem was I couldn't hire anyone to man the grocery because they don't want to work 24-hour shifts, right? Or three-day shifts, uh, sorry, three, three shifts in a day. Right? And their skill set were, you know, for a war room level, meaning they didn't know about logistics, about point of sale, of POS systems, of special inventory systems, etc., etc. And they had to build that from the ground up. And perhaps more importantly, they realized that when they go to the communities, they had to face a very tough um, problem in building social capital, because a lot of times the war rooms, the friendly neighbor stores, were also basically small microfinance into to institutions. Because if I couldn't afford this, uh, this uh, box of wheat or this box of spices, I can just make this time, right? Yes, yes, yes. Um, but they couldn't offer that, but instead they had to show that we are still friends. So they made sure they, ma they, made, they built in community uh, uh, spaces in their stores so that people still see them as a friend rather than as a big store trying to wipe out the mom and pop stores. Um, and that's deep localization. It it's goes beyond the usual business terminology of localization, right? It means actually rooting yourself, right, in the local and growing with the local. Jollibee, of course, is one of our other ASEAN champions. And localization is both as, I would say, skin deep as making the spaghetti sweeter or developing that nanghap sarap goodness in the beef burger because apparently Filipinos don't like 100% beef because it tastes bland, so they put some marinade in it. And that is localization, sure. But deep localization goes beyond that, and Jan Jollibee knows that, which is exactly why they try to develop communities. As you know now, they have this uh, sustainability program with uh, vegetable farmers, where they source, I think, anywhere between a third to half of their, local, of their vegetable sources from local, small, cooperative farmers. And that helps both them and the farmers. It helps the farmers because the farmers are able to increase the quality of their produce and have a guaranteed buyer. And it helps Jollibee because they have a steady supply of fresh produce near their um, aggregate kitchens. So that's deep localization. <clears throat> Third is that because of this patient capital, and precisely because you have to work with patient capital, um, firms were able to develop market power. And this is the nasty side when of, of ASEAN business, when you talk to a lot of people from outside the region. They say, if you look at a lot of these firms and the ASEAN champions on your list, many of them are monopolists or oligopolists, as we call them. Right? But on the one hand, it might be a function of the market being too small to accommodate too many. 
On the other hand, of course, um, I might have friends here from the Philippine Competitiveness Commission, um, and because I work for a competitiveness center, I have to say competition is always better. Right? But it just seems to be a fact, and we're just stating objective reality, that the reality seems to be that for a lot of the top ASEAN firms that have succeeded, they have leveraged strongly on market power. And that leveraging of market power means they have power to innovate, to afford good governance and corporate discipline. Because on the one hand, a big firm can be a big bad firm. But a big firm tends to also be a firm that has the resources to be a really good one. Um, and of course, it's only the bigger firms that can fill in the gaps right? that many times you find in this area. And finally, our ASEAN champions had to foster or begin their ambitions of internationalization. Now, the, I'm sure one of the questions you will ask later on, I'm going to answer it right away now, is if you look at these ASEAN champions, are they really regional champions or are they mostly local champions? The reality that we have found is most of these firms are in fact just local champions. And we're saying these local champions are probably the ones that have a greater chance of becoming regional champions, precisely because they're champions already, right, in their home local fund. But that is where, I guess, I, we have to ask this question of what will it take for these champions to enter the new league? Um, I sort of summarized all of the strategies we observed. Again, we're not prescribing this. We just observed this among our champions. Um, and these firms basically have what you call mobilized institutional grassroots. Forgive me, again, that's my Western co-authors fancy wording. And really what they just mean by that is working with the messy environment that we are in and growing with that messy environment. Now the interesting thing there is that environment has grown. There are still infrastructure gaps. A while ago in the earlier presentations, you said people are complaining about the internet, our digital infrastructure. In the Philippines, we still have to complain about EDSA. Took me about two hours to get here, right? uh, from Quezon City, right? Um, but slowly but surely, a lot of these infrastructure gaps are either being filled or taking on a different form. Which is why we have to ask this question. Because if you ask me, look at this list of firms, you're maybe asking one of the Philippine firms, SM, Prime Holdings, Ayala, Meralco, EEI, EBC, right? Uh, Wholesome Lafarge, Philippines, um, uh, uh, Jollibee, right? Cebu Pacific. Many of these firms are old industry firms. And many of the firms in the other ASEAN countries, by the way, the representation from all there, are old industry firms. Which brings us to that next question. These are the things which made, made these firms successful in the last 50 years or so, judging from their performance in the last 12 years. And these are the strategies which worked for them. But I wonder how this will work for them as we move to the future. If you believe that the future is in digital, Unfortunately, none of our ASEAN champion firms are digital. Perhaps they will try to use digital marketing, digital operations, digital tools, but none of them are in the same world as the Ubers of the world, right? The Amazons, you know, your big alphabet, Amazon, Apple, right? Facebook. None of them are in that era. And so does that paint a sad picture of ASEAN? Maybe not necessarily so. Uh, maybe, again, it's just all about patient capital. When the market finally needs it, then these companies might step up. Right. So I'll, I'll end my, my uh, discussion here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jamil. That was really very interesting. It filled a void in the <laughs> understanding. Uh, really, how do we really move ASEAN forward at, at beyond this piece? So, yeah, we did have very interesting presentation, I think, that um, was very, very link, much linked together. With, uh, in the first sessions, we had uh, industries and sectors, which gave you know, a lot of insight, especially those two sectors that we covered. And then we had a presentation of people, no? like the Shiva. So how do how how can we how 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 is ASEAN? How uh, from the point of view of people? Now we have firms 
and uh, especially uh, us and ch champions uh, to, to meet who we need. So we all just have to work together to really go um, beyond what we are now as Pentaasians. And now, so next, I think it's a very appropriate topic. So we go step back and hear a presentation from uh, um, Mr. Louis Dane Merced, who is a senior foreign affairs research specialist okay, uh, with the ASEAN program section of the FSI. And he undertakes policy-oriented research and analysis on issues and developments in ASEAN as they affect national and regional security. He provides policy consultations and other inputs for different offices in the DFA. He obtained his master's degree in international studies from the University of the Philippines, D school, and his, his university, his Bachelor of Arts in International Studies under um, uh, in International Studies, major in American Studies degree from Yellowstone University. The other school. <laughs> uh, so uh, uh, please, uh, Louis, uh, to present uh, his, uh, uh, his paper on um, Reflecting on ASEAN's contributions to the region and the world. First, I would like to thank uh, KSEN and uh, Dr. Pariatos, the lead convener, for inviting me to this uh, symposium. Uh, at the beginning, I was a bit hesitant because uh, I'm not an economist, and, uh, and I will not pretend to be one. Uh, my background is uh, international relations and uh, political science, but uh, hopefully uh, you will find value in my presentation because I think uh, I'll be providing uh, the bigger picture and we'll try to complement uh, our understanding of ASEAN that goes beyond the economic community. So I think the session, the, this second uh, panel is, I think, very appropriately structured because the first one talked about people, which is more the social cultural pillar, and then the second one on the business side, so AEC. So for now, I'll be talking a bit more about the political security side and try to understand how ASEAN has performed in the past 50 years and what to expect in the coming years. So uh, this presentation uh, is based on a commentary that I wrote for FSI uh, of the same title, but for this presentation, I will try to add a few more uh, points. So this will be the outline of my presentation. So uh, I'll summarize the ASEAN's contributions into two main strokes, partnering for change and engaging the world. So for partnering for change, it's uh, ASEAN's contribution to regional stability, then its role in facilitating national and regional economic development, and its role in improving the lives of the people. While for the engaging the world part, it's ASEAN's role in the broader Asia-Pacific region in how it facilitates regional dialogue and cooperation. So I think the main uh, idea that I want to uh, share with you is that the story of ASEAN is captured by the 2017 team, Partnering for Change, Engaging the World. And for the past 50 years, ASEAN has brought positive changes to the peoples of Southeast Asia and has actively contributed to regional and global peace and stability. So uh, without uh, the risk of sounding like a government spokesperson, but I think that the team selected for this year uh, really sums up uh, what ASEAN, the story of ASEAN. And although, of course, partnering for change, change is the favorite word of this administration, but if we really reflect on what ASEAN has done, it's really about these things, partnering for change and engaging the world. So, of course, we know uh, ASEAN has uh, gone through a lot, uh, starting in 1967 with just five countries. Uh, it has uh, expanded to 10 members, and along the way, uh, there were a lot of agreements uh, from the TAC to the ASEAN Vision 2020 and 2015, then the ASEAN Charter, ASEAN Community, and now we are celebrating the 50th year of ASEAN. And also along the way, there were a, a lot of challenges for ASEAN, uh, starting with the Indochina Wars, when Vietnam invaded Cambodia, how ASEAN responded to it. 
and then the Asian financial crisis, then the uh, SARS epidemic in the early 2000s. So over the years, ASEAN has actually demonstrated uh, adaptability and being able to really react to whatever new challenges uh, come up. Okay, and I think there's uh, slightly distorted in the dimension. But anyway, I think the main contribution of ASEAN to the region and to the world is that uh, it has uh, really promoted peace and stability in the region. I think this is often uh, overlooked or underappreciated, but if you notice, uh, in Southeast Asia, we never really had um, a major armed conflict, at least since ASEAN was founded. And uh, this is quite remarkable given the, the diversity in membership in so many ways. From geography, you have Indonesia, which is an archipelago of 17,000 islands. Then you have Laos along the country. In terms of economy, you have two of the richest countries, perhaps you know, per capita GDP, Singapore and Brunei. And you have uh, a lot of developing countries like Laos and Cambodia and Myanmar. And in terms of political system, you have monarchies, you have one state part, one state, one party government, uh, you have uh, multi party <coughs> governments in the Philippines. And uh, also in terms of culture, uh, historical experiences, so while we in ASEAN have a lot of things in common, we actually also have a lot of things that you know different among us. And it's quite remarkable that we got together and got along well, because if you also recall Southeast Asian history, we actually did not really get along well prior to ASEAN. So there were a lot of bilateral tensions, uh, for example, Philippines and Malaysia over Sabah, the Indonesia and Malaysia, the Konfrontasi, so there's still a lot of uh, mutual distrust and still unresolved tensions within Southeast Asia. And I think it's really quite a miracle that uh, ASEAN was able to, ASEAN members were able to come together, uh, put aside to those differences, uh, abide by, agree to abide by the same principles uh, and uh, what they call the ASEAN way of uh, consultations and consensus building. And somehow they were able to move forward. So, uh, yeah, as I mentioned, uh, ASEAN is criticized for not really solving problems. They say that as ASEAN just tries to keep it under the rug and just suddenly things explode. But I think the way ASEAN works, uh, it really focuses on the informal and the non-legalistic way of dispute management. Uh, uh, um, a scholar said that uh, ASEAN uh, actually diffuses tension by urging restraint among its member states. And um, ASEAN members, uh, actually when they pursue national objectives, uh, they cannot really completely push for it because they are now also conscious about their uh, regional standing. Uh, and I think ASEAN has uh, approaches really about socializing all Southeast Asian countries to abide by the same principles as the basis for interstate uh, conduct. So even uh, when ASEAN expanded to include uh, the CNMV countries, Cambodia, Laos, Myanmar, and Vietnam, uh, despite international criticisms about these countries in terms of human rights or what they did uh, in the 80s, uh, ASEAN actually embraced them. Uh, and it's quite a unique approach and I think it has served Southeast Asia uh, very well. Okay, and also I'd like to uh, just add that even though ASEAN's approach to conflict management is more on the uh, informal and non legalistic way, ASEAN member states nonetheless have uh, experience in actually resolving their conflicts through even the use of third party mechanisms. So, if you look at the case of Asipat and Ligata between Malaysia and Indonesia and uh, Thailand Cambodia border case, uh, there's a willingness among ASEAN countries to resolve their differences uh, even through uh, rules provided by international law. Okay, so. Uh, uh, I think the absence of an armed conflict in uh, Southeast Asia has paved the way for the second contribution of ASEAN, which is uh, it has provided an environment that is conducive for economic growth and development. So uh, initially, uh, ASEAN countries prioritize economic cooperation as a way to foster regional stability because to them, uh, the main threat, at least in the 1960s, was not really a military threat from outside, but the main threat for ASEAN member states was really uh, regime stability, and these are caused by uh, economic and social uh, instability. 
So if you, if you recall, uh, during the 70s, the concerns about spread of communism, uh, the domino effect, and how it might uh, affect uh, ASEAN member states. So when the five countries came together, they really prioritized promoting economic cooperation as a way to attain uh, regional stability. And uh, however, over the years, ASEAN uh, has uh, come to realize that uh, building economic uh, stability should not only be about you know the individual members but they also need to come together and try to uh, prosper one another in order for the entire region to be more uh, economically competitive and uh, resilient amidst uh, the flux in the global economy. So uh, ASEAN economic integration with the uh, uh, AEC in 2015 has opened a lot of opportunities uh, and has also allowed uh, the newer member states to catch up and be integrated into the global economy. So for example, uh, ASEAN has the IAI, uh, Initiative for ASEAN Integration, that seeks to assist the CLNV countries to catch up with the rest of the ASEAN members in terms of uh, economic development. So without ASEAN, uh, I think it would be more difficult for these uh, countries who are quite late in the game to actually prosper their respective economies. Okay. And uh, the third contribution of ASEAN, in my view, is that it has helped in improving the lives of, of the peoples in the region. So some would argue that uh, this particular uh, contribution may still be uh, inadequate or I think still lacking in this regard. But I think ASEAN, uh, as a community that tries to be people-oriented and people-centered, uh, has actually uh, encouraged and even committed the member states to attain progress in a lot of aspects. So from political security, so ASEAN uh, blueprints uh, compel states to make fine progress in human rights, in good governance. Then in AEC, uh, it compels uh, countries to do more in promoting economic uh, and livelihood of the people. And while in the social cultural community, uh, it encourages countries to uh, address social issues, uh, promote uh, social well-being, health, education, etc. And uh, uh, I think earlier uh, in another, one of the presentations said that uh, there's still little appreciation about what ASEAN does for the people and the benefits that we get from it. But I think one point that should also be raised is that uh, ASEAN, its very nature, is still pretty much an intergovernmental uh, organization so whatever commitment or agreement is done at the regional level it will really de depend significantly on the national implementation by each government so in a way ASEAN uh, facilitates improving the lives of people by laying out all these blueprints all these plans and agreements but uh, it's also critically important that all member states also do their part in order to meet those goals so, for example, when uh, the AEC was about to be launched, there were concerns in the Philippines that, oh, our local firms might lose out uh, in the process. But I think the AEC, uh, what it uh, taught the country is that we have to also get our act together and do much more in, or in order for us to fully avail of what opportunities AEC can bring. So, in so yeah, that's for how ASEAN uh, promotes or improves the lives of uh, peoples in the region. Okay, so, and uh, the fourth contribution of ASEAN, uh, I think, uh, and it is very important, is how ASEAN has become at the forefront of regionalism in the Asia Pacific and a uh, uh, key facilitator for regional dialogue and cooperation. So ASEAN has engaged all relevant players in the Asia Pacific through a web of uh, bilateral and multilateral mechanisms. There's the ASEAN post ministerial conferences and the dialogue relations, the ASEAN plus one, like ASEAN Canada, ASEAN Japan. And then there's also the ASEAN Regional Forum that uh, uh, puts together 27 countries in the Asia Pacific to discuss uh, regional security issues, confidence building. And uh, for example, ARF is one of the few international organizations or regional fora where North Korea is a participant. So aside from the UA, uh, ARF is one of the few uh, platforms for North Korea to express its uh, positions in 
the world. And it's also an opportunity for the rest of the region to engage this country and try to seek ways on how to address, of course, the problems in the Korean Peninsula. So uh, this role of ASEAN, what we call uh, ASEAN centrality, is about ASEAN being a driving force for regionalism. And uh, it has done, it does it through encouraging external powers to also subscribe to the same ASEAN norms and principles. So the same principles of uh, non-interference, uh, peaceful resolution of this peaceful settlement of disputes, uh, non-use and non-threat of force. So in fact, before any external party can uh, be a dialogue partner or have formal relations with ASEAN, they need to also sign the Treaty of Amity and Cooperation, which lays down the sort of uh, what should be the code of conduct or uh, in Southeast Asia or in dealing with ASEAN member states. Okay, so uh, initially, uh, so this is uh, the Asia-Pacific multilateralism. So if you notice, there are a lot of overlapping uh, groupings, but you can see that ASEAN strives to be at the forefront of this uh, multilateralism, and uh, not just politically, but even economically. And this one is a, a clear picture to see ASEAN centrality. So from the core 10 members to the dialogue partners, East Asia Summit, ARF, and the <coughs> ASEAN Plus One Dialogue Partnership. So initially, ASEAN's engagement uh, with the rest of the world, uh, initially, uh, they were quite apprehensive because, uh, again, their emphasis on non-external interference, right? ASEAN did not want to be embroiled in the great power rivalries. However, over the years, ASEAN has uh, realized that they also need to engage with the rest of the world for them to attain regional peace and also uh, regional economic development. And initially, relationship with the dialogue partners were really more on uh, securing technical assistance, development assistance, but over the years it has evolved to now include discussions on a broad range of issues, whether it's uh, strategic issues or non-traditional security issues like climate change, disaster rate, etc. So I think uh, over the years ASEAN has grown more confident perhaps in engaging uh, our external partners and uh, ASEAN, uh, as one IR scholar said, uh, tries to only, they call it om omni enmeshment, so that's ASEAN's approach to regional security by giving uh, sort of a platform for all regional powers to have their interests somehow advanced, but at the same time trying to mitigate great power uh, rivalry. So how is ASEAN able to attain centrality? Well, there are many perspectives. So some would say that uh, ASEAN as a collection of 10 small and middle-sized states somehow uh, is in a better position to lead regionalism because it doesn't invite suspicion from other major powers. For example, uh, the Japanese, Japan may be more comfortable with having ASEAN as the driving force of regionalism than allow China, which is a regional rival, to run the show. So same way with, let's say, US and China. So I think there's, uh, in a way, being small, but at the same time being united, is a strength for ASEAN, especially in this part of the world where there are too many major powers that are trying to compete with each other. And while on a more practical side also, I think ASEAN wanted to assert centrality by being inclusive and being open to all major powers because uh, in a way, uh, it will sort of uh, provide balance in the region. So uh, in the early years of ASEAN, it was said that they wanted to, to keep the U.S. engaged. They don't want the U.S. Uh, to withdraw. At the same time, they didn't want Japan to uh, resort to unilateralism, you know, during the memories of uh, Second World War, while at the same time, uh, ASEAN didn't want to make an impression that they were containing or ganging up on China. So by being open to all these major powers, by providing the space for them and trying to engage each one of them, I think ASEAN is also contributing to maintaining uh, regional stability in the Asia-Pacific. Okay, so uh, of course we it would be uh, enough for me to just talk about uh, contributions and achievements of ASEAN, but we also need to at least identify some challenges, especially as ASEAN enters a new phase of its narrative 50 years onward. And, but I'll just try to go through them very quickly. So the challenges for ASEAN are first, how to cope with the evolving regional security architecture. So while ASEAN has managed to bring all major powers together and somehow keep some 
same plans of stability. Right now, the regional security architecture is in a flux with uh, major powers now seeking to influence uh, the region uh, in their favor. So it will really depend on ASEAN unity and how we assert centrality on whether or not we'll be able to maintain that position in the region. And uh, another challenge for ASEAN would be how to respond to non-traditional security concerns, especially when you still have the ASEAN ways emphasis on consensus building and the principle of non-interference. As we all know, many of the challenges right now, like the haze uh, problem, uh, climate change, even drugs, disaster relief, refugee flows, they cannot really be addressed from a purely uh, state-centric or a very traditional way of having state borders. ASEAN has to find a way to reconcile you know, these new issues with the way ASEAN has been operating in the past, which is emphasis on non-interference and consensus building. So, and institutionalization. So is, there, is ASEAN all about form over substance? So ASEAN is criticized for having too many meetings, like hundreds of meetings, hundreds, lots of documents, but they say it doesn't really lead up to anything. And uh, yeah, uh, before ASEAN was said to be very minimal in bureaucracy, but now it's starting to become very big with all the sectoral bodies. And really it's about how do you translate all these agreements into concrete benefits for the people? And again, going back to my earlier point, point. Uh, it, will, it will also depend significantly on what national governments will do. So how will they implement uh, ASEAN agreements and ASEAN blueprints, etc. And then uh, another challenge for ASEAN in the coming years, I think there's still a need to be more proactive in addressing bilateral tensions. So although ASEAN has succeeded in keeping them under the rug, usually when there are diplomatic crises suddenly erupt, let's say uh, uh, Thailand, Cambodia, border dispute before, or when the Lahad Dato incident happened, uh, ASEAN is often caught unprepared or cannot do much in addressing these regional, these bilateral tensions. So I think uh, ASEAN member states, even though maybe not through ASEAN, but as they try to find or develop a shared ASEAN community, they would also be need to be more proactive in finding some progress in addressing this bilateral tension. So we cannot let all these things slip under the, or keep be kept under the rug. We have to be more proactive in dealing with this. And building national resilience and addressing development gaps. So this will still be a challenge for ASEAN. And I think uh, ASEAN's position, its centrality and its unity, it will be more effective if all member countries will be resilient, uh, economically and socially. So, and that will include really addressing the development gaps. So all the issues that we say about ASEAN being divided, that you know, some are uh, more uh, in favor of China with economic uh, incentives, I think ASEAN will be less vulnerable to major powers dividing us if every one of us is actually economically developed and resilient. And last is uh, building an ASEAN identity. So it's a less top-down approach. So again, ASEAN is still very much government-driven, uh, it uh, tries to be people-oriented where it benefits the people, but I think the next phase is really about people-centered ASEAN community, where in other sectors, uh, private sector, uh, the youth, uh, marginalized, marginalized groups, indigenous peoples, have a greater role or they can forward new uh, initiatives and they can participate more in ASEAN community building. So I think this is uh, a challenge. Also. In order to raise awareness about ASEAN, it is all of us should feel that we are part of it, we benefit from it, and at the same time, we can contribute to it. So uh, in conclusion, uh, a retrospect of ASEAN's journey in the past five decades reflects its positive contributions to the region and to and its people. However, the next phase of ASEAN's narrative is about building on the successes, addressing and learning from shortcomings, and become even more proactive and united in the face of uh, new globe, regional and global developments. So that's all. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Julie. Uh, I, we, are not, we, are not, we have been, not been very good in managing the time, but I think um, it was worth it listening to many good points that we've had from our presenters. I think maybe we have five uh, minutes before the synthesis by 
by <laughs> Dr. Kimba here. So if, if you have yeah, burning questions, yes, of course, from uh, June. <laughs> yeah. This is the reason why I didn't want to be the moderator, okay? I have uh, questions first for Dr. Francisco. No? You, you, you documented the, um, the, uh, the story of the champions. I don't know, as an economist, did you document the other side? What were the costs in attaining this championship? I'm sure there were social costs. I can think of one, okay? One is the uh, uh, regulatory capture, and that's one of the reasons why they have market power. And before you answer, I also have a question to uh, Mr. Uh, Merced, okay? Uh, you talked about the ASEAN way of being informal and not legalistic. Where is Mr. Merced? Yes, here. Oh, there, okay. How was the elevation of the Philippine claim in the West Philippine Sea or the South China Sea to an international tribunal received by other ASEAN claimants? You want to answer your question? <laughs> yeah, thank you for that question. Um, short answer is no. Um, shamefully, I did not f play my role as an economist looking at it, um, meaning uh, objectively and formally. But you know, top of the head, um, what, what, at what cost, if you want, did these champions become champions? Um, we don't have the numbers to show whether, for example, you know social welfare, total welfare actually went down because of the capture of the market, so forth and so on. But at, you know, at the very least, and I think maybe just being optimistic about it, I think that a lot of the companies, or if not all, well, most of the companies in our list at least, we made sure that they also grew with the communities they were in and helped those communities grow. In fact, that's one of the factors that we, that we had. Although we based it primarily on financial performance. We had to, to, to converse with expert opinion, uh, expert opinion providers to ask them, okay, why are these firms are bad firms? Maybe these are firms that are actually known to be corrupt. In fact, there are a handful of firms that came up in the list that we decided uh, that they were flagged because of the many articles and um, investigations of corruption or whatnot, that we had to remove them from the list. You know? um, we didn't look at that specific angle, but actually, maybe I can conclude by saying that many of these firms had benefited the markets that they had thrived in, just as they had took advantage of those firms, right? And we can think of whether, you know, when, yeah, whether it's the Ayalas or the SMs or the Adrian Group or the Yoma or the Keppel you know, uh, companies. Um, on the one hand, they had taken, taken advantage of these institutional voids. Maybe there is some capture, right? A regulatory capture uh, in certain aspects of doing the business, but the longevity of these businesses, a lot of them had to depend on how they were able to temper that greed, if you want. Mm -hmm. no? But sure, there is some sort of regulatory, regulatory capture perhaps in certain sectors, um, certain aspects. Um, telecom companies, for example, in Indonesia would have that on the list. Um, and of course, a lot of these champions are monopoly firms. No? And yet, I guess a key element of the success yeah, is precisely knowing how to temper the greed and share some of the wealth, because clearly some of the things that they're doing have been benefiting societies they are in. So it's, it's kind of great. Good answer. <laughs> okay, uh, Dr. Tulio, about the South China Sea and the whole of ASEAN, when I said that ASEAN, uh, it's a focus really on informal and non-legalistic. -legal However, uh, in my presentation, I also said that uh, ASEAN member states per se are not necessarily allergic to a more legalistic way of addressing these truths. It's just that they don't really look at ASEAN as the venue for addressing this. Uh, ASEAN's role has really not been about mediating, but more of really conflict management and conflict, conflict resolution. So for example, uh, Singapore and uh, Malaysia, Thailand and Cambodia, they were, they were able to bring their cases, federal disputes, to ICJ. And when it comes to the uh, arbitration case by, by the Philippines on the South China Sea disputes, well, I think the country did it uh, in its own prerogative as a sovereign state. So, and I think somehow there's a, 
an implicit uh, understanding that there's not uh, a lot of things that ASEAN can do really in stopping China from uh, reclaiming or being assertive in the disputes. And I think when the Philippines filed the case, uh, ASEAN was generally quiet about it. Uh, because again, the very principle of non-interference, they look at it as uh, it's the prerogative of the Philippines. But at the same time, ASEAN, uh, even though it's, it really cannot resolve the dispute, it tries to be to contribute to dispute uh, management by negotiating on the code of conduct and by uh, emphasizing the declaration of the conduct of parties. So, yeah. Uh, of course, I think the South China Sea dispute is a test case on how ASEAN will try to move forward. Uh, is conflict management enough? But when you're given with these uh, new developments, uh, are we left uh, just at the sidelines or do we need to do more? So I think that would be the answer to your question. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Joey. I, I don't think we have more time for question and answer, but if there are really basic questions. Question. Okay, so. Uh, it's time for the closing human synthesis. Uh, I don't know. Uh, <coughs> there's introduction in case, okay, no? For answering my question. <laughs> 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 uh, I give the floor now to Dr. Francis for. Not for <laughs> <laughs> Enough of the moderation. <laughs> I have to be moderated. <laughs> uh, it's past 12, so good, good, good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I am tasked to provide uh, synthesis and closing remarks. So this is the task that puts me in between you and a very good lunch. So for my sake, uh, I will keep this short. Um, okay, so um, my synthesis will try to tie the presentations together uh, using the theme of uh, ASEAN in a digital world. Um, I think uh, that that works well, especially with our theme, um, Beyond ASEAN at 50. So uh, uh, our distinguished speaker earlier mentioned that um, digital innovation is one of the themes that the Philippines has chosen in its chairmanship of ASEAN. So I think that also uh, blends well with uh, my theme for my synthesis. Um, our two presenters from De La Salle have provided the rationale for focusing and studying uh, digital innovation or digital world. Um, uh, mainly that uh, so these two are um, because this, this is the world we live in and this is the world that we're going to face in the next uh, couple of decades. And also because the Philippines is a services driven country. This is what we have seen in uh, Ms. Castillo's presentation. Uh, uh, we have seen that the current state of digital animation in the country, that it provides uh, around 3,000 jobs, that the industry is mostly local sub subcontractors and the sector is hampered by costly internet service and uh, bad internet infrastructure. And we've also seen that um, techno technological inequality may be as may be as detrimental to the country as income inequality. And we've seen that from the second presentation. Uh, and then we move on to the three present presenters that uh, looked at ASEAN from the point of view of the people, the firm, and politics. Um, I guess um, Dr. Siar's presentation um, showed us that from the people's point of view, the pressing problems of the Philippines includes the internet, which supports our the findings of our second presenter. And um, for ASEAN, one of the pressing problems is inequality. That it also relates to the what our second presenter has talked about. Uh, moving 
So the thread has now flowed from the first two presenters to Dr. Siar's presentation. And now I move to Dr. Francisco's presentation that looked at the ASEAN champions that succeeded, um, the, ASE the companies that have succeeded in ASEAN. Um, let me just highlight the role of innovative thinking that's merged with uh, entrepreneurial foresight. And um, because this is one of the key findings that uh, Dr. Francisco has mentioned that may have led to the success of these ASEAN champions. Um, leveraging market power means that they have the power to innovate. And so innovation is also important. But he also mentioned that, um, unfortunately, none of our champions are digital at the level of what we see in Uber and in uh, other highly developed countries. So I guess there is room for improvement and there is room for innovation policy in, in ASEAN. So now the thread tries to well, I think this is the most difficult part. As I try to tie the final presentation using this thread of innovation. But towards the end, uh, Mr. Merced, um, although in Mr. Merced's presentation, he has successfully, uh, he has shown us many things where a CN is successful, um, especially in terms of preventing armed conflict and through informal non-legalistic dispute settlement. But towards the end of his presentation, we see, we saw that um, ASEAN faced with the challenge of, he identified the importance of considering or thinking, or considering um, relating the relationship of technology in non-traditional security issues vis-a-vis -vis the ASEAN way. And especially now, because technology and innovation has moved so fast, we need to consider uh, how do we protect our country? How do we protect ourselves from issues of, techno of hacking or technological security? And I think uh, we need to work with our ASEAN partners to resolve or to prepare for these issues. Okay. Um, so just one more minute before I, uh, I'll before we proceed to lunch. So for my closing remarks, I have mainly two, two main messages. First, um, technology and innovation can be seen as a double edge. Sorry, um, it can foster, it should foster growth and development. And um, we have seen that in economic theory um, tells us that. But in the digital age where we are faced with inequality, with people being left behind and being prone to um, alternative facts and information that's not necessarily true and um, prone to uh, populist ideas, I think there it is now time that we consider what is, how do we leverage innovation? How do we leverage technology in this digital time? And second, let me talk about um, the role of PASCN. Uh, this, to be honest, this is the first time that um, I am attending APA <laughs> General Assembly since I got back from the IDS uh, last year. Yes, it's just me. Uh, anyway, uh, and I see the value in having this symposium. We we hear from our partners what does what's the research that they are doing, and we see that these are very good researchers. Uh, and I guess there is value, and we should maybe continue on having these uh, partnerships with our part uh, with with the network and we 
continue doing them, not only in Manila, but also in other parts of the Philippines, because there's value in, in what we have, in what we saw in today's presentation. So um, uh, I guess that I am closing uh, with the, those two points, and uh, thank you very much, and good afternoon. Wait, wait, wait. I will do the closing remarks. <laughs> this is a 30-minute lecture, okay? <laughs> no. On behalf of De La Salle University and the Angelo King Institute for uh, uh, Economic and Business Studies, I'd like to thank all the participants of this um, annual meeting and symposium of the Philippine Apex Study Center Network. Not because I'm the host, I think, you know, I think it was a very productive uh, day, and uh, we're on time, okay? And uh, we are, I think we have answered the, the theme, uh, the opportunities and challenges of, uh, from the industries, from the three pillars, okay? Economic pillar, security pillar, and the uh, social cultural pillar of uh, the ASEAN community. So again, thank you very much and enjoy our lunch. And after the lunch, we'll have the business meeting of the network. Thank you.